Middle School, Prologue and Act Two, This American Life Transcript by Ira Glass. Prologue, Ira Glass. Hey everybody, Ira Glass here. So we got this email at our radio show near the end of the last school year from a 14 year old. Annie, hello, Ira Glass. Hey, is this Annie? Annie, yes, Ira Glass. I called her up at her house in California and asked her to read it. Annie. It says, Dear This American Life, I just escaped the whitewashed, brick-walled, iron-gated prison that is commonly known as middle school, and I'm finally out for good. But in all the time I've listened to your show, I've never heard an episode devoted to what goes on inside the walls of a middle school. I hope you'll think about it. Anonymous. Ira Glass. Yeah, you signed it anonymous, but then your email was signed with your name. Annie. Yeah. Ira Glass. Yeah. Annie. I did anonymous because in middle school, everybody is so judgmental, and I didn't want the kids to judge me or anything if they heard me on the radio. Ira Glass. Mainly, she says that she wrote to us because she and her friends were talking right after they left eighth grade about how terrible middle school was. And she wondered, was it just as bad for other people as it was for them? Annie, you always wonder whether other people are going through the same thing as you, and it'd be cool to hear other people's stories about it and what they went through. Ira Glass, and if you had to explain to somebody, what are the worst things about middle school? Can I ask you to walk me through it? What is so bad about middle school? Annie, Kids there are all in socially awkward stages, that the drama every day can be frustrating, and girls write things that are, that are someone like so-and-so, and then no matter who you are or what you do, you'll get made fun of for it. Anything, anything in the world you can get made fun of for. Ira Glass. In Annie's case, she had friends who smoked, so she got criticized for, for smoking, but then she was also made fun of for not smoking, for being too much of a sissy to start smoking. She was made fun of for coming from a bilingual elementary school where everybody learned to speak Spanish and spoke it throughout the day. Annie, and leaving elementary school, I guess, I thought that when I got to middle school, everyone would think it was really cool that I spoke Spanish. But when I got there, they mostly just thought it was dumb. I don't know if they were jealous or what, they would make fun of me for it. Then they'd say, we are all full of ourselves that we spoke different languages and stuff. Ira Glass, did it make you feel bad? Annie, yeah, I didn't want to stick out that way. If I got a new sweater or something, say for Christmas, that I really liked and I would really want to wear it to school or something, but I'd be nervous because what if somebody didn't like my sweater or something or someone made fun of me for wearing it? It can be hard to do even the smallest things because you're so nervous that people tease you or judge you from it. Ira Glass. That sweater example. Is that a real example? Annie. Yeah, it actually is. I worried about it so much. I had a pair of moccasins that I never worn and they're kind of my signature now. Everybody really likes them. They're ankle-high lace-up moccasins. Ira Glass. And how long did you have the moccasins before you actually wore them? Annie. A few months, probably two months. I guess I just thought if people didn't like them, they would all make fun of me for wearing them, and I didn't want to stand out that much. Ira Glass. What could be done to make middle school better? Annie, I don't think you can really do anything about it. Nothing. Ira Glass, we talked about this for a little while. She said basically everybody comes into middle school as a little kid and you're going to have to grow up and figure out who's in what group and who you are and who's above who. And you're going to have to figure that out somewhere at that age, right? It might as well be in middle school. And it was terrible, she says, but now she's in high school. Annie, whatever middle school was, it worked. Everyone 
is a lot friendlier, and everyone's lives are a lot better now. Ira Glass. Well, today on our radio program, for Annie, we look at whatever it is that happens in those mysterious years that we call middle school. We have stories today from all over the country, people lurching their way through these years when you're figuring out so, so much. We go to middle school dances and classrooms and down to the Mexican border. From WBEZ Chicago, it's This American Life, distributed by Public Radio International. I'm Ira Glass. Stay with us. Act two, stutter step. Ira Glass, act two, stutter steps. One good place to see the experiment that is life in middle school in action is a middle school dance. Last Friday, there were middle school dances all over the country, all at the same time, and we sent reporters to half a dozen of them to find out how kids were doing. They talked to them before the kids went inside to the field of battle. And, no surprise, we found a lot of stress, a lot of uncertainty. Rob. Who's nervous about tonight? Girl one. I am. Rob. Why? Girl one. Well, just you don't know what it's going to be like, and I'm just confused. I just don't know. Yeah. Ira Glass. These four girls are sixth graders, and they're in a car on the way to a neon-themed dance at, en at Edgewood Middle School in Highland Park, Illinois, with their mom and reporter Rob Wildeboer. Rob, who's going to dance with a boy tonight? Girl one, nobody. Girl two, I don't know. Girl three, I can tell you that. Girl four, no one in this car. Ira Glass. Roughly 800 miles east in New Jersey, sixth grader Ethan DeRose was, helping, was hoping there would be at least one slow dance, though he did feel, though, did he feel ready for a slow dance? Ethan, nope, not at all. Brian Reed, why not? What are you worried about? Ethan, I just don't know how to do it. I'm not sure that I'll do it correctly or, yeah. Ira Glass. He's standing in front of the school with one of our producers, Brian Reed, as the kids stream into the school. Ethan is wearing a button-up shirt with green and black stripes that he is not happy with. Ethan, that was my mom. She made me wear it. She said that if I don't wear the two shirts that I am wearing right now, I can't go to the dance. Brian, what are you hoping happens at this dance? Ethan, I'm hoping nothing bad happens, like no humiliation or not something that'll be a story for the next month or two. Ira Glass. Of course, of course, Ethan and the girls in the car in Illinois are sixth graders. In New York City, seventh graders Evelyn Benson and Alice Westerman are excited and feeling very grown up on their way to their school's Halloween dance. Evelyn. I'm really happy because last year they split the gym in half, so it's light on one side and pitch black on the other. All the sixth graders are banned from the dark side, but that's where all the cool kids are. So now we're in seventh grade. We can dance on the dark side, so it's like, woo, we're cool. Alice, dance on the dark side. Ira Glass. Some of the middle school boys got up the nerve to ask girls to be their dates to the dances. But because this is a new experience for the girls, too, being asked out on a date, they don't exactly know how to handle it. Here's a girl named Autumn talking with our producer, Lisa Pollock, in Delaware, the afternoon of the dance. Lisa, did you get asked to the dance? Autumn, yes, I did. Lisa, and what did you say? Autumn, I said I don't know, but I probably won't say yes. Lisa, wait. You haven't told him yes or no yet? Autumn, no. Lisa, okay, so it's 1.20 and the dance is at 7. Autumn, yeah. Lisa, when do you have to let him know? Autumn, I probably won't answer. Lisa, are you serious? Autumn, yeah, I just kind of want to hang out with the girls. Lisa, so he's the only one who asked you? Autumn. 
There were other people, too. Lisa, how many? Autumn, probably five-ish. Lisa, five boys asked you to the dance? Autumn, yeah. Lisa, you told all these guys I don't know? Autumn, yeah. Lisa, what if they took that as a yes? Autumn, then they got the wrong answer. Lisa, do you say I don't know because it feels too mean to say no? Autumn, yeah, I'm not mean. Ira Glass. Of course, some of the boys are no better. During the dance in Wyndham, Maine, our reporter, Claire Holman, pulled sixth grader Christopher Potter out of the action for a chat. Claire, is there anyone you like at the dance? Christopher, yeah, there is. Claire, how does she know? Oh, does she know? Christopher, yes, she does. We're kind of dating at the time. Claire, so how's that going? Christopher, good. It just started 20 minutes into this, so yeah. Claire, you asked a girl to go out during the dance? Christopher, no, a girl came to me and asked me out. Claire, okay, let's go over it minute by minute. So where were you when this happened? Christopher, I was in the cafeteria. Just got a drink of root beer, and she walks up to me and asks me to go out. Claire, what did she say exactly? Christopher, she said, Chris, will you go out with me? Claire, and were you surprised? Christopher, not really. We've kind of been on and off again. Claire, so it's not the first time. Christopher, yeah, not the first time. Claire, but she always asks you, do you ever do you ever ask her? Christopher, well, it's kind of weird because it's always she wants me to ask her. So it was weird that she asked me. Elliot, usually they don't last. It's a middle school relationship. Nothing really happens. Eric, what does that mean, a middle school relationship? What do you mean it doesn't last? Jonathan, it's destined to fail, pretty much. Elliot, yeah, because it's middle school. This isn't where you're starting, starting your life with. You don't hear things about middle school sweethearts. Ira Glass. In Richmond, outside Moody Middle School's dance, reporter Eric Menel spoke with Elliot German and his stepbrother Jonathan Lawton. Both they're, they're both eighth graders who ran through the official rules for the dance. Jonathan. So some of them are kind of funny because I mean it's it's like no hands below the waist, no petting, which I thought was kind of funny. Eric, wait, no petting? Jonathan, yeah, no petting. Eric, what does that mean? Jonathan, no one knows. Elliot, it was specifically on the flyer that they hand out. They give you the dress code and then they give you the rules. No petting. And it's in quotations. And you never know what it means. Do people sit there at dances and just pet other people? Because that would be really weird. Ira Glass. There are rules like this at all the dances and some more comprehensible than others. As for whether or not the kids obey the rules and what actually happens inside the dance on an actual dance floor, one of our producers, Lisa Pollock, went inside to, to the dance floor at the fall costume dance in Lowe's, Delaware, and I'm going to hand it off to her. Lisa. So the scene in the gym was pretty much the way you remember it. Older kids dancing in the middle, younger kids at the periphery, a few aim, aimlessly wandering around, looking like they're not sure what to do. Lots of kids were dancing, jumping up and down. Occasionally, you'd see a fist pump. They dance in these tightly packed clusters, very little room between them. And outside of the clusters were chaperones, ready to step in if they saw anyone grinding or suggestive dancing. Hovering outside one of these clusters was a teacher named John Gauze, and he looked perplexed. John. This knot has got me on edge at this point. Lisa. Why? John. Because they're trying to get away with stuff. You could tell by the way they're looking at you. They have a guilty look because you're about to see me swoop. Lisa, he actually did swoop. 
He plunged into the pack of kids, pulled the boy aside, and talked to him. Then he told me why. John. He needed to be taken aside and told to stop being up against those girls like that. I don't want to jump in too much, but I just want to give them a whoa. The flat hand, whoa. Just whoa. Just calm it down a little. I mean, usually, if I see it, then they're going to stop because they see me. Lisa. And then comes the moment of truth, the moment that forces every kid in the room to make a decision, the moment that separates the timid from the brave, the slow song. I watch it with teacher, with teacher Brian Kamra. Brian. So we got our slow song. And just as I suspected, a majority of the students left the dance floor. All the couples are in the middle of the dance floor in a cluster. I suspect so, they're not near an adult. Lisa, I love how the kids go up to the couples dancing and interrupt them. Brian, oh, absolutely. Lisa, some of the couples didn't have much privacy. Their friends were standing a foot away, hanging out and talking to them. And every so often, a random kid would just cut across the dance floor. Lisa, this girl right here just got grabbed onto the onto the back of her friend's neck while the friend was dancing with the boy. Brian, yeah, I don't know if she didn't want to be left out or they came as friends. I think at this stage of the game, it's hard when boys and girls pair off and then one friend is always left behind. Lisa, there are a few of these slow dances, but most of the songs are fast. And then suddenly the song, Hit the Road Jack, starts playing and the lights snap on. Lisa, oh my God, just like that? Oh my God. Brian, yeah, it ends very abruptly. It's nine o'clock. It's nine o'clock. Lisa, that's it? Brian, that's it. There's no wind down, nine o'clock. Lights come on, parents are waiting. It'll be empty in another minute. Lisa, and he was right. The experiment in mini adulthood that is the middle school dance was over. The same kids who minutes earlier were holding each other and swaying awkwardly on the dance floor got into cars and said hi to their parents. Ira Glass, Lisa Pollock, coming up, surviving middle school by pretending that you are from a completely different family. That, that is in a minute from Chicago Public Radio and Public Radio International when our program continues.